Hi, my name is Andrew Greenfield, and I'm an IBM Global Storage and Security Engineer. And today I'm going to take you on a tour of the SVC and Flash System HyperSwap Failover Fail Back, or I like to call it Choose Your Own Disaster functionality. This was all done in the IBM Poughkeepsie Lab in New York, and it's going to showcase how HyperSwap is perfect for your mission critical applications. Now, what do I mean by this? Across all of the IBM portfolio, the DS8000, the flash systems, the store-wise, we have HyperSwap, which allows you to make sure your mission-critical applications can survive many, many types of failures. Now, we've documented this over the years in various red books, red papers, and blue papers. All of these links and all of the items that you might want to go into a deeper dive with are available in the metadata as well as at the end of this video. Now, I'm going to show off this live functionality in just a little bit. If you want to skip ahead, feel free to go ahead. I just want to make sure that those who might not understand HyperSwap or storage technologies have a little bit of an overview. So what I'm going to show you right now is two different storage systems acting as one, and they're going to provide storage to an application that is mission critical, and that's what's called the Aja speed test. So this application is very sensitive. So it's going to be trying to read and write as fast as possible Hollywood video type frames. And when it encounters any problems, it'll actually show them off graphically very quickly. And what's really important is if at any time it can't write or cannot read, it will crash or immediately respond with an error. And you're not going to see that because HyperSwap, despite all of the disasters I'm throwing at it, will make sure that it has backups and failovers without anything to be done by the application or an owner, or an IT staff member. Now, how do we do this? So those two volumes, or LUNs as we like to call it, are going to be in synchronous replication. But it's better than just synchronous replication and the fact that if a read or a write comes in on one side or the other, it'll automatically be handled without any problem, again, without any IT staff member. So let's actually take a look at that in a little bit more detail. So that means a host in this particular case, or the CPU that's running the application, will have a series of paths. So they'll have preferred paths, shown in green, or the non-preferred, shown in yellow, between these various different systems. But the host is only going to see one ID, actually one volume. Even though it's going to see all these paths, it's only going to think it has one. Now, in my case, not only do I have the host as a virtual machine, but it's actually on the actual same HyperSwap one that we're going to throw all these problems at. So you can have a host on either side or both sides of a particular environment, all reading and writing all at the same time, all thinking everything is fine no matter what disasters come through. Now, how are we able to do this? All of the major operating systems like Linux, Red Hat, SUSE, Cent, as well as Windows, use multi-path drivers. So that is how we're going to do our magic. So the host will see all these different paths to a single volume. And so when some of those paths go away, either because a failure of the storage system, a failure of the network or the pipes, it'll keep on going by selecting different paths automatically without crashing, without any intervention of the storage administrators or the host administrators or a network administrator you're about to see that in just a second. How are we doing this? Asymmetric logical unit access, we like to call it a Lua, that is part of every major operating system and it's automatically going to change those paths and HyperSwap is gonna make sure that the storage arrays are in 100% lockstep so that no matter what's going on above with a Lua and the multipath, that those volumes are 100% in lockstep without any impact to the actual application. So let me just make sure you see this in a little different way. So let's just say that we have those hosts, they're reading and writing, but then because of certain things that might happen, how do we know which host or which SCSI volume might survive in case one goes down? Well, we have tiebreakers. That's what we call the quorum witness. So we're not gonna show that in this video per se, but it's there doing its magic job. So that logic is basically that we want to make sure the host IO always continues no matter what failure. So that quorum witness is always going to manage and monitor everything that's going on and make sure that 
if it needs to step in as a tiebreaker between two different storage systems, it'll choose the winner based on the logic. Now, what does this look like under the covers? Sure, in a hyperswap mode, you're gonna have two sites, even if they're at the actual same site, even if they're actually in the same rack, they're gonna be labeled as site one and site two, and you'll see as IO group zero and IO group one, and we'll put them together, electronically speaking, using Fiber Channel or iSCSI, and once they are together, you can easily create a volume that's in both. And that way, no matter what happens to either site or either side of the storage equation, that application will still keep on running. How easy is that to create a volume? Very simple. In the GUI, you just click on the Hyperswap tab and you'll be able to put it on any particular pool you want and the size and it'll automatically create it in less than three mouse clicks. Not a problem. Now let's get into the live demo here of the two V7000s in hyperswap mode. Now you're gonna see this video in real time, so I'm not gonna show you anything but the truth. So let's first start off here with the setup. You can see my virtual host here on that single VMDK that's on my dual V7000s. You're gonna see the data store here. You can see it's called the CCBU hyperswap test. And there's that single V center that I'm running it on. Here's the V7000 in hyperswap mode. And you can actually see there's my host. And as you can see, this host is only running this particular volume, but this volume is on two V7000s in hyperswap mode, known as the V7000, Peter the Great, you'll see at the top part of the screen. And as you can see right now, zero activity going on. Now, let's start that activity and you'll see immediately on the right hand side, and that's why you're seeing all these windows, so you can see everything in real time without any Hollywood fake. So take a look, as I just started up, you'll see that all of a sudden, everything starts spiking up. You'll take a look at the upper right of the screen, as well as the upper right of the upper left window, and you'll see that those IOPS, megabytes per second or gigabytes per second, all correspond now to actually what's going on on the V7000 array. So as you can see, a little bit bump in the CPU, but more importantly, is that this 4K Hollywood workload is generating about 70,000 IOPS. Now let's take a look at the paths because that's gonna be my first wave of disaster here. You can see all these paths right now that I have zoned properly across the entire fabric. Now only a, a subset of these are going to obviously this particular host, but it's gonna be useful for our upcoming disaster tour. So here we are again, take a look. You can now see that I'm doing well over a gigabyte per second or well over a thousand IOPS, in this case, 70,000 IOPS overall per second. Take a look here, 70,000 IOPS. So this is on a good day for this particular host and I'm switching over to megabytes per second. You can actually see there we go that I'm actually writing well over two gigabytes per second here. And you'll see the host in the upper left in its live form using RDP, by the way. And again, take a look here are those paths. Now take a look, we are going to actually now go into sand nav because I have a brocade fabric here and I'm gonna start yanking entire ports. You're gonna see some of those members, see those double fours there. I'm gonna remove them so I'm gonna save this definition and I'm going to immediately then activate this fabric disruption. In this case, it's going to disrupt this V7000. So remember they're in hyperswap, so I'm yanking some paths. And so let's watch what happens here. As soon as I click on okay, I want you to pay attention to the upper left and the lower left part of the screen here. You'll actually see that the application goes, wait a second, oh, wait a second, my paths are changing. That's right, the operating system, in this case Windows and VMware are adjusting the paths that just got yanked. And you'll see that here on the window on the upper right, take a look, you'll see that the path removal and it rebalances out. Now take a look, even though I just yanked some paths, some of those non-preferred paths just became active. And so I'm pretty much at the same place I was before this first disaster that I did. I yanked some paths, you're absolutely right. Take a look at my megabytes per second, and you can see those IOPS per second too, give or take, depending on how you wanna look at it. So again, this is all in real time, and I want this to stabilize a little bit, 
before we do our next disaster here. So I'm going to rescan just to prove the point here and take a look here. I'll scroll down again. Look what just happened. So my numbers are lower. Now remember this particular host has other targets, but the biggest target that we're worried about right now is this particular host right now. So you see that I've yanked some of those paths. Yet the IOPS and the megabytes per second are still pretty much undeterred. It had a little bit of a, a degradation, but it didn't crash or anything like that. And again, to prove this point, we're going to go to the zones. And I'll bring back up that zone right now. And now let's click into the zone itself. You'll see that those ports one and two grouping are definitely removed. So now let's think about doing something even more disastrous, shall we? I'm going to bring back up my performance. You see that I've pretty much stabilized out. So now let's actually reboot an entire node. That's right, node two right there. A node that has a whole bunch of paths as well as processing. I'm just going to reboot it. Now take a look. It immediately, notice the writes immediately were affected. The reads weren't as much. And it's still going though. It's still going. So I've yanked an entire hardware node. And it's going to rebalance those paths. So watch, even though that first disruption of the node going down took it down a little bit, by rebalancing those paths over surviving non-preferred, now preferred paths, Take a look here in the lower left. You can see that I still have those other nodes available. And notice it's rebalancing and coming back as best as it can by marking other paths as preferred. You can take a look here as it's climbing back up here. So still not a bad situation whatsoever. My application hasn't crashed. It's now getting back to almost where it was before. But now we're down numerous paths as well as an entire node of the entire system. Now I'm going to let this stabilize again before we do some more. Now, if you're really eagle-eyed about this, you'll see the purple sketch on the lower part of the upper right. And you'll see that that's the SAS. That's right. That is some of the internal drives doing hyper swap and rebalancing some of the I.O. across the surviving nodes. Now let's go to our next disaster. I'm going to yank even more paths out of this. So I'm already down an entire node, already down a whole bunch of paths. Here we go. We're going to save this and then we'll activate it in just a few seconds here. Same thing as before. So I'm going to go over to my zones. And now let's activate it. So I want you to take a good look at the upper left now and watch as soon as we click on OK, you're going to see how we're going to again really try to cripple this application. Okay, another path or series of paths has been yanked and now it's rebalancing again. Take a look. And you'll see this charted in the upper right as well. So there it is. Some more paths removed, yet it's rebalancing to the best of its ability now and starting to, again, relearn those paths. So again, this is a tribute to Alua and multipathing of both Windows as well as VMware on all the surviving paths. Now again, proving again this to any of the naysayers, I'm going to make sure inside VMware, you're gonna see those paths shift. Again, I've yanked even more paths. So there it is, the proof positive once again. So as you can see, I have started to stabilize after the last disaster I just threw at it. And now let's see when that other node is going to come back. You'll see I'm going to click refresh here. It hasn't come back yet, but it should be back any second now. I want to show this in real time so you can see that when that node comes back, it automatically joins and does everything automatically. Again, no intervention from the support staff, IT staff, or anybody else. So especially for SVC, we can add hot nodes or cold nodes into the mix and make sure you have even more resiliency for a hyperswap solution. So here we go, take a look here. It just discovered that node is coming back. So it paused some of the IO for a second and then jumped straight up. Again, the application 
did not crash, did not stop. Some of those IOs were delayed, but then it immediately caught back up and jumped huge because all of a sudden now, even though those paths aren't necessarily all back, I have another whole node back. So as part of that fan out or best practices, all those surviving paths are using all of my nodes once again and take a look, that's still pretty good. Now, again, back to the repair side of our functionality. So we've come back from our node and we've gotten more or less more than 85% of our original that we started with. So now watch what happens here when I start putting back in those other paths that we had yanked. And again, all live, all without stopping the application. So I'm going to put all those other storage ports and those members back into the same zone. As you can see, here's that zone again. Now we're going to then save it and then activate it. And then you're gonna see the operating system again, as well as VMware, again, rebalance across those paths. So here we are again, going to my zone set. I'm gonna activate it. I'll click on save. Watch again in the upper left. I'll magnify this for you. Take a look. It's gonna immediately see those path changes. You saw that little dip there. And it's gonna say, hey, wait a second, what's going on here? So it's relearning now both preferred and non-preferred paths. See that dip again? All of a sudden, as those paths, all of a sudden start coming back on, Windows is relearning as well as VMware. So you'll see a little bit of the dips and you'll see this charted up on right as well as on the left-hand side. There we go, we're back into our thousands again. There's the restoration and the rebalance that we've been talking about for the last few seconds, but there it is charted. And in a few seconds, you'll actually see those rights. There you go. You'll start seeing those rights starting to get up a little bit closer to the 1100 mark, which is pretty much where we were before we started messing around, or basically around 70,000 IOPS. So as you can see, we're almost there right now. You'll see it start charting around 70,000 IOPS in a few seconds. And that is our demo. We have now done numerous disaster failovers and fail backs all while the application has consistently gone on without any hiccups whatsoever. By all means, if you have any questions, I want you to reach out. And thanks again for watching this video. I look forward to seeing you soon at a future IBM event.